Professor Trenton Holiday, thanks so much for coming back onto Evolution Soup all the way from your office in New Orleans, Louisiana. You are a professor of anthropology as well as interim associate dean at Tulane University in New Orleans. Last time we talked about your book, Cro-Magnon, the story of the last Ice Age people of Europe. Cro-Magnons were part of our own genus, that is a group of closely related species, genus Homo, and it's the fascinating origins of genus Homo that will be the subject of our deep dive today. So, have you been, Trent, and our last interview proved to be very popular indeed, and we both received quite a lot of positive feedback after that show. Yes, we did, and uh, I owe you a big thanks, because the publishing industry is a little opaque, um, hard to get sales data, but Amazon you can see your rank, and I definitely saw a spike in book sales uh, associated with this podcast. So thank you for that. And uh, I've also heard from students I had decades ago, so it's nice to hear from former students who happened to catch this and, and enjoyed it. Um, I'm still waiting to hear from the students um, who gave me that Mr. Potato Head. We'll see if anybody remembers giving me a Mr. Potato Head at some point in my long career at this point. Well, human beings are classified as homo sapiens, and despite the myriad of creatures on this planet, we don't share our genus with any other hominid species. But this wasn't always the case. Trenton, can you give us a breakdown of what genus homo is and when it first appeared? So the genus homo is our genus. There's only one species, as you mentioned today. There may have been as many as nine or even 17 different species of homo um, during the history of the genus. We emerged about three million years ago in Africa. The, um, that emergence is, we don't have any fossil data for that, but it looks like there's a split between um, one lineage that goes to the genus Homo and another lineage that goes to the robust Australopithecus or Paranthropus. We do have evidence, fossil evidence for Paranthropus at about three million years ago. The earliest evidence we have for the genus Homo is a mandible from Leti Gararu, which is in the Afar region of Ethiopia. That mandible, however, has some affinities, as some scientists have noted, has some affinities to Australopithecus. To me, that's not too surprising because if you imagine a species that splits, after the split, you expect the descendant species to become more and more different. But that also means that as you get closer to the split, you expect the species to become more similar. So it doesn't surprise me that the earliest members of the genus Homo looked more Australopithecus-like. So in general, if you were saying, what are Homo-like characters? Um, you would say they have smaller faces, smaller back teeth, they have bigger brains, and the brain case is shaped differently um, than Australopithecus. But we, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, I suspect. Before we move on, it might be a good idea to distinguish between the genus Homo and the group it emerged from, genus Australopithecus. So how far back does the Australopithecus line go, and when is it generally accepted to have given way to the genus Homo? So Australopithecus as a genus, the earliest species is Australopithecus anamensis, which appears about 4.2 million years ago. And interestingly enough, it's a species that has a diet very similar to that of chimpanzees, it looks like it was eating a diet mostly derived from trees and shrubs and not from grasses, which is kind of fascinating to me. Um, the subtribe Australopithecina, which may be a bit of a junk pile taxon into which we put every primitive potential hominin, that dates back to as far back as 7 million years ago, where we have Sahelanthropus, Chadensis, which is a, a fossil species, fascinating genus and species that may be a hominin. I tend to accept it as a hominin. Uh, some researchers think it's not a hominin. They think it's a, an awkward, odd looking ape. Some people have even suggested that certain features link it to the genus gorilla. We also have a 
Auroran, Auroran Tugenensis, which is about 6 million years ago from the Tugan Hills of Kenya. That to me, there's a, there's a femur associated with it, which looks like a bipedal femur to me. So I tend to think that if you have something walking around Africa 6 million years ago, bipedally, a bipedal ape, to me, that's a hominin, something that's more closely related to us than it is to chimpanzees or bonobos. So it's been around a long time, 7 million years. So right after the split of uh, chimpanzees and, and humans, the hominin line, one direction, the chimpanzee line in another direction, we have the austral piffs. And um, about 3 million years ago, one of those austral pithecus species is probably the ancestor of the genus Homo in, in Africa. So if we're thinking about differences between Australopithecus and Homo, one of the differences that people talk about all the time is big brains. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on one's perspective, we do have some members of the genus Homo who have small brains, and we'll be talking about that later. But one of my favorite features of Australopithecus that distinguishes them from Homo is something called post-canine megadontia. Now, it sounds fancy, post-canine megadontia, but it just means big back teeth. And Milford Walpoff, in one of his books in the 90s, said something that stuck with me for years, and I love it. He refers to Australopithecus afarensis as a chimpanzee-sized animal with gorilla-sized back teeth. So Australopithecus afarensis dates to 3.9 million to about 3 million years ago. It's East African species. It's Lucy species, and they have post-canine megadontia, these big back teeth. They are indeed um, chimpanzee-sized animals with gorilla-sized back teeth. So I have a cast. This is AL200-1A. Not that I should be spitting out these uh, names to you all. But if you can look at this, this is a palate, so it's an upper dentition. It has a little bit of the nasal cavity there, not terribly prognathic. And then this is a cast of a chimpanzee skull. And so what I want to do is put the two together in such a way that you can compare the size, if I can get my finger out of the way, compare the size of the back teeth. So you can see, I mean, for starters, um, hominins tend to have much smaller canines than our chimpanzee cousins. You can see that. Um, but also just look at the size of the back teeth. I mean, just huge back teeth relative to uh, a chimpanzee in this Australopithecus. Now, I said, well, I didn't say it. It was actually Milford Walpoff said they're chimpanzee-sized animals with gorilla-sized back teeth. So I have a female gorilla. And if we put those two together, I think you can see that the back teeth are indeed um, about the same size much larger canines, even in a female uh, gorilla. The other feature that you might say distinguishes Australopithecus is something called post-orbital constriction. A lot of posts in this. So if you look at the orbits, this is Australopithecus Af africanus. This is STS-5. This is Plez, yes. <laughs> yes, this is Plez. Um, if you look, it's almost like somebody has squeezed behind the orbits. Um, that's called post-orbital constriction. Um, and this is just a reflection of a smaller frontal lobe of the brain and bigger chewing muscles. If I show you k and ER 3733, I don't know why I keep spitting these out. This is Homo erectus or what some people call Homo ergaster about 1.8, 1.7 million years ago. If we look here, it's, it's much less post-orbital constriction, um, behind the, the eyes. And if you really want to see some post-orbital constriction, look at the hyper-robust austral piss, like Zinge, OH5. Um, this is what, you know, austral pithecus or what many people, and in fact, in my new book, I call it Paranthropus boisei, huge back teeth, post-canine megadontia, just giant. And then you can also get a feel for that post-orbital constriction as well. Um, quite quite impressive. So that's just a smaller frontal lobe, smaller brain associated with big chewing muscles. And that distinguishes. So in, in the genus Homo, we tend to have a, a cranial shape that looks like the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes are expanded. We have smaller chewing muscles because we have smaller back teeth. We're not having to process food 
um, with our back teeth, likely because the genus Homo is dependent on tools, in particular stone tools. Now, I'm not saying Australopithecus didn't make stone tools. I'm not saying Australopithecus didn't use stone tools, but they don't seem to be dependent on it the way the genus Homo is. And in fact, those tools may be used to access high quality food sources, such as the fatty marrow within the long bones of animals, breaking open the long bones, eating this high fat resource, which is a lot, what allows us to grow this big brain. Our brain is a big, expensive metabolic organ. Um, so those are kind of some major differences between Australopithecus and Homo. Classification Homo has been around for well over 200 years, but how has science changed over the decades in the understanding of this group? What is our understanding of the genus Homo today as compared to the early days of paleoanthropology? So what I would say is there's a fascinating story about um, Homo habilis and its discovery by the Leakeys in 1960. And it actually brings back our old friend Zinge here. So Zingianthropus was the genus name that Leakeys originally gave to this specimen, Olduvai Hominin 5, that they discovered in Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Mary Leakey discovered it in 1959. And they were very excited because in 1959, they had finally found the maker of the Oldowan tools, a tool industry that as of last year, we now know dates back to 3 million years ago. They finally found the, the tool maker and it was this specimen, Zingianthropus boisei. Now, Zing means East Africa. Or it's an, an old Arabic word for East Africa. Anthropus means human. And boisei was in honor of the Boise Fund who had funded um, their excavations and, and their work at Old Divide Gorge. So this is that hyper robust Australopithecus. It's about 1.8 million years old, got big back teeth, small front teeth. 1959, he makes it into National Geographic. He's a, he's a famous, he's a celebrity. And then in 1960, so this is Old Divide Hominin 5, in 1960, they find Olduvai Hominin 7. Now, Olduvai Hominin 7 has bigger front teeth um, and relatively smaller back teeth. So if I hold up, this is a different individual. This is Australopithecus boisei. And you can see, I think, if I put them close together, that there's a big difference in tooth size, posterior tooth size, between these, these two specimens. So... Um, it also had, there were parts of the cranium preserved. Now, the part of the cranium that was preserved were these two bones, these green bones here, the parietals. And so you can imagine, can you imagine trying to guess the brain size of an organism based on just those two bones? You don't have the front of the skull. You don't have the back of the skull. You just have, you don't have the bottom of the skull, but you have these um, two parietals. So there was a huge error range in estimating the brain size of the OH7 individual, but it seemed like it was about 600 to 700 cubic centimeters. The modern human average is about 1,350 cubic centimeters, so roughly half the size of a modern human brain, but the size of the brain of Zingianthropus is probably about 550, um, so it was bigger than Zingianthropus, or what we now call Paranthropus boisei, and it didn't have any evidence of this sagittal crest, this um, crest that's formed by the two large chewing muscles. You can feel if you grit your teeth on the side of your head, they're called temporalis muscles. If you have big enough temporalis muscles and a small enough brain, you can form this crest between that serves as an attachment area. So that's a sagittal crest because it's in the mid sagittal plane. Um, this guy has it. OH7 didn't appear to have it. And so suddenly they have a specimen that they think, okay, this guy, the one they found in 1960, OH7, this is the tool maker. And poor Zinge that I just showed you, this is the victim of the tool maker. 
perhaps, you know, this is, this guy went from being the chef de cuisine to uh, what was for supper. <laughs> um, and they found some other individuals that they also uh, included as being homo-like. This one in particular, this is OH13, that's the mandible. Um, this is the maxilla. These teeth are very modest in size. As I tell my students, if you have teeth this size and your dentist sees them, your dentist isn't going to say anything. Probably the dental, dentist will be saying, well, little big teeth, but you wouldn't actually say anything about it. So those are in some ways very modern looking teeth. I mean, there's aspects of them that are, you know, to an expert, you would say, oh, yeah, that's not a that's not a homo sapiens tooth. But it's much more um, human like. And in terms of the shape of the teeth in particular, Australopithecus boisei. If you look at these posterior teeth, they tend to be big from side to side. So what's known as buccolingual. So buccal refers to the cheek, lingual refers to the tongue. And so the, the molars tend to be expanded from tongue side to cheek side, whereas those molars in the genus Homo tend not to be. So if you look at the maxilla of OH13, you can see that the teeth are not expanded buccolingually or from cheek side to tongue side. And in fact, they appear maybe perhaps slightly longer from the midline or following the tooth row to the incisors. That's called mesial distally. Distal is towards the back of the tooth row. So the tooth dimensions are different. Um, they're much smaller back teeth. The anterior teeth tend to be larger. I don't know if you've gotten an appreciation for this, but Boise Eye has huge back teeth, but the front teeth are tiny. Absolutely, you know, they're really tiny. And there's no evidence of sagittal crest, et cetera, et cetera. And so in 1964, Louis Leakey, the husband of Mary, Philip Tobias, who a, was a South African paleoanthropologist, and um, Napier, who was a, a sort of an expert, an anatomist, a British anatomist um, focused on hand skeleton, they named a new species of the genus Homo based on this, and that species was Homo habilis. Now, one thing I didn't mention about OH7 is there was an associated hand skeleton with it as well. And the hand skeleton appeared to have expanded apical tufts. So relative to chimpanzees, we actually have expanded fingertips from side to side. And what this does is it creates more friction between our fingers and any object we're trying to manipulate. So it helps in terms of making tools. The other bone that was kind of of interest to, uh, to Leakey and company, and particularly Napier, was the base of the thumb. So right here, there's a bone called trapezium. And um, it's at the very base of the thumb. So the first metacarpal, which is this bone here, sits in it and it's a saddle shaped joint and in humans that joint is very much more open than that the joint is in chimpanzees and it's thought that that openness allows for more um, manual dexterity we also in humans we have an opposable pinky i don't know if you realize that but our pinky is actually slightly opposable as well um so based on the hand skeleton based on the fact that the Cranium lacked the sagittal crest and appeared to have a bigger brain based on the size and shape of the teeth, which with smaller molars and premolars, they named this new species Homo habilis. And habilis means handy or capable. And it, so it people refer to it as handyman, kind of, you know, it's actually now this guy is this OH7 character is the maker of the old one tools and Zing is not. Um, so how did they say this thing or these things, because they had other specimens that they put into this hypodyme, OH7 is the type specimen, but there are others like OH13 I showed you. How do they know that that's homo? Well, they came up with four criteria. So the first criterion was it has, homo needs to have an absolute brain size of 600 cc's or more. Now, 600 cc's is less than half of 1350, which is the modern human average, right? And they actually cheated a little bit with this 600 because in the early 20th century, Sir Arthur Keith 
had argued that 750 was the sort of Rubicon for human brain size. So genus Homo needed to have a minimum brain size of about 750. Now, how he arrived at that, he just looked at sort of the small end of Homo sapiens range and the largest gorilla brain he could find. And the average between those was about 750 cc. So it's not terribly scientific. So traditionally, big brains, 750 cc's, but in order to get OH7 over that Rubicon of 750, they had to lower it to 600. They also said Homo possesses language. Now, I know that anybody watching this right now is like, how do they know Homo habilis spoke? They don't. So that language doesn't fossilize. Um, I'm not going to tell you Homo habilis couldn't speak, but I'm certainly not going to tell you they could. They also said Homo has the ability to make stone tools. Again, Mary Leakey had been finding these old one tools for years, and now we have the real tool maker, not poor Zinge. And then they also said you need that, you know, expanded fingertips and you need that very opposable thumb, the more open joint here at the base of the thumb. Now, a lot of those features that I've just mentioned, the sort of traditional view of who gets to be in the genus Homo, they're untestable, right? And they're not in keeping with evolutionary biology and taxonomy and other disciplines of evolutionary science, right? So how do, how do biologists define genera? And the problem is, they don't do a very good job of it. There's no agreed upon um, definition of a genus in evolutionary biology. Now, this prop, I hope this is gonna work, Mark. This may be the silliest prop you've ever seen in your life. Um, let's imagine that this branch that I found in my yard, let's just imagine it's a, a tree of life or one of the branches of the tree of life where we have one species that's splitting into multiple other species. So we could say um, we want, Billy Hennig wants any kind of taxon. So if I channel my seventh grade science teacher, Ms. McGee, she said, killing people can often fail good students. And that was kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So those were the sort of, in the Linnaean hierarchy, those were the original um, taxa or uh, that were created, I guess not taxa, but categories. Now there are more taxa than that or more categories than that. Now we have subfamilies, we have superfamilies, we have subphyla, we have infra um, phyla, we have um, sub tribes and I said subfamilies already. So there's a lot of ranks in the Linnaean taxonomy and the genus is just one of those ranks. But what Vili Hennig said is he wants any taxon in evolutionary biology, he wants it to be all the descendants of an ancestral species. You can't leave descendants out because they look more primitive. You can't leave descendants out for any kind of reason. So all taxa need to be what is known as monophyletic. So all the descendants of a common species. So you, you could say, well, this could be a genus here. They all share a common species. I don't know how well you can see that. Or this could be a, a genus here, these two perhaps. Um, but you can't say this is, a, this is one genus, this is also in that same genus, but this one isn't. Um, you can't have that, that was called paraphyly. So if you use the, the family name Pongidae, for example, which is the great ape family. And if we were in the 1950s having this conversation, we would say, oh, there's the Hymenidae, which is the human family. And the only hominids that are around today are humans, and that's still true. And then if you had an ape family that was the Pongidae that included bonobos and chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans, then that is a false, it's, it's a paraphyletic group because chimpanzees and bonobos are more closely related to humans than any of us is to a gorilla. And then gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans are more closely related to each other than any of us is to an orangutan. So you can't create taxa like that. 
But the problem is that there's no guidance. So if you have an evolutionary relationship and you have a tree, you can say, well, this could be the genus or this could be the genus or this could be the genus. As long as it's monophyletic and it includes all the descendants, it's, it's okay. So there's no guidance as to where we draw these lines in the Linnaean hierarchy, just as long as we're including all the descendants of an ancestral species. Now, that's problematical, right? That's, that's a clade approach. So a clade, it, it's, Vili Hennig came up with this terminology as well. Clade is derived from the ancient Greek word for branch. And so a clade refers to a group of organisms who are descended from a common ancestor. So, and it has to be all of them. You can't exclude some of them. There's also something called a grade approach, which is sort of an organizational approach or a complexity approach. So the genus Homo, for example, you would say, well, we're more complex. We're, we're a higher grade than say the genus Pan. Um, and so we should be in a separate um, genus or in, in the case of back in the day, a separate family than the apes. So if you think about Sesame Street, I don't know if you watched Sesame Street, um, but Sesame Street used to have this song, one of these things is not like the other. And if you're practicing taxonomy like that, the Hominidae just being us, and then the Pongidae being all the other apes, that kind of makes sense from sort of a practical, well, you know, in a grade sense, humans have clearly had, um, we've evolved much more rapidly and more divergently than our cousins, the apes. So there's not a lot of guidance as to um, how, at what level we assign a genus. How do we determine what a genus is? Uh, Cladus, people who sort of follow the Vili Hennig model would say, well, it needs to be a monophyletic group, but at what level? Well, you could say, well, we could use recency of common ancestry. How recently do they share an, uh, an ancestor? Or we could say, do they share ecological similarity? Do, um, do all members of a genus exploit one type of uh, resource and another genus exploits another? We could measure genetic divergence. Who's more genetically similar to whom? And that's used a lot nowadays because we have genomes, entire genomes we can play with. Or you could talk about discontinuity versus continuity in morphology. Uh, it works especially with fossils where you may not have um, DNA. So there's no agreement. And in 1999, uh, paleoanthropologists Bernard Wood and Mark Collard sort of tackled this and they came up with a new way of defining a genus. And it was kind of a clever way of defining genera, which is the plural of genus. They said a genus is a monophyletic group of species that shares a common adaptive zone. So uh, they're saying it's monophyletic, so you can't leave out any descendants, but they're also saying that all members of a genus share a common adaptive zone. Now, what they then did is looked at several, because these are fossils, they're looking at anatomy, and they looked at things like um, brain size, they looked at body size, they looked at aspects of locomotion, they looked at jaws and teeth, like the things I just talked about, uh, they looked at growth and development, um, and they looked at body shape, and then they made determinations as to who really looked as if they were in the same adaptive zone as we are, Homo sapiens, and who should be kicked out of the genus Homo. So, um, for example, Homo erectus, or African Homo erectus, what some people might call uh, Homo regaster, it is bigger in body size. It has a bigger brain. The brain size of this individual is about 800 cc's. So not huge, but bigger than, um, than anything I've talked about so far. Um, you know, human-like teeth, there were, there's evidence. Some of these are actually associated with, with limb bones. And so we can see that they have modern human-like body proportions and, and aspects of the femur that are very modern. And so these guys make it, they are allowed to stay in the genus Homo. However, 
Homo habilis, and I'm not showing you OH13 this time. I'm showing you um, a specimen that was discovered in the 1970s by Richard Leakey in Kenya, eastern shore of Lake Turkana. This is one of my favorite fossils in human evolution. This is um, KNM ER1813, and she has a lovely Homo like cranium, if you ask me. She's got very Homo like teeth and a palate, you know modestly sized cheek teeth, perhaps not for her body size. I and mean, we can imagine that she wasn't terribly big, not a lot to go on body size here. Um, but her brain size is only about 510 cc's. So she doesn't make the cut, um, that 600 cc cut that we talked about earlier. Um, so he kicked Homo rudolfensis. They kicked Homo rudolfensis. I'm sorry, Homo habilis out of the, out of the, out of the genus, they kicked uh, Homo rudolfensis, which has a, a much bigger face, much larger brain. This particular individual, this is KNMER 1470, has a brain size of about 770 cc's. Um, unfortunately, the teeth are missing. We do have some more recent specimens we found that do have teeth. I think they were recovered in 2012. Um, he kicked them out of uh, the genus Homo. He also kicked uh, the poor Homo floresiensis. I think I, well, Homo floresiensis, so this relatively recent small brain species, they kicked it out of the genus Homo as well. And my problem with this is that they looked at, to determine whether you were, um, belonged to the genus Homo or not in this adaptive sense, they said, are you more similar? Are you more similar to Homo sapiens? Or are you more similar to Australopithecus africanus? Kind of stacking the deck. You know, it's sort of stacking the deck. This is the most derived species in the genus Homo. The most recent species as well. I mean, obviously, we're much more recent. So to look at this specimen, which is about 1.9 million years old, and say, because you approach this specimen in brain size, never mind that, you know, there's a different facial morphology, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you don't get to be in the genus Homo. To me, that's problematical. And the other thing I'll mention is that you have to look pretty hard to find cladistic or phylogenetic relationships that have been reconstructed by paleoanthropologists to find one that doesn't have homo as a monophylum. In other words, almost all the cladistic analyses that are published out there that you can find today group things like homo erectus slash or gaster, homo habilis, I don't have another hand for Rudolph Enzis, homo sapiens, they're all said to be to share a recent common ancestor with each other they are a monophylum it's all the descendants of a of a common ancestor and in that regard i i think that since i'm comfortable that these are all more closely related to each other than they are to any other hominin taxa they all belong in the genus homo and we need to let go of some of the assumptions we make about brain size, um, body size, and even limb proportions and body shape. So I didn't mention it earlier, but Australopithecus tends to be thought of as having longer arms, the forearms, I think, are particularly this is the case, and shorter legs than the genus Homo. I've published a lot of material on this that, that suggests that it's not quite so simple the other problem that nobody seems to want to address is we don't have a lot of postcrania that we can say for certainty what species they belong to. So here's a femur. This is one of my favorite fossil specimens. So this is a femur. It's about 1.8 million years old. It's um, K&M ER 1481. A lot of stuff from uh, Kubifora, the eastern shore of, of Lake Turkana. There are aspects of this femur that are clearly homo-like. So can you see how if we trace up then there's this flare out that's very homo like the femoral head is pretty big i would say that's homo like the neck is a little longer than you tend to see in people today 
Um, but there, everything about this femur says, hey, this is genus Homo. Now, the problem is it's 1.8 million years old. There's Homo erectus, what some people call Homo ergaster, walking around Africa at 1.8 million years old. There's Homo habilis walking across Africa at 1.8 million years old. And there's Homo rudolfensis walking across Africa at 1.8 million years old. We don't know. We don't have, except for Homo erectus, we don't have associated postcrania limb bone remains for early Homo. And by early Homo, I mean those three species. And there may have been more um, in Africa right around that time period. Making sense of the human lineage has turned out to be much more complex than anybody could have anticipated as new discoveries are made and breakthroughs in DNA reveal new species and evidence of interbreeding between species. The old idea of a linear march of progress is now seen as more of a braided stream, or as you've called it, a tangled web. Trenton, how can we begin to navigate this tangled web? So that's, that's the tough question um, because it's really simple to talk about Darwin's metaphor of the tree of life. But if you have different branches of this tree that are exchanging genes at some level, it makes reconstructing who's more closely related to whom more difficult. So in my last discussion with you, we talked a little bit about recent DNA advances and the fact that Homo sapiens was exchanging genes with Neanderthals and exchanging genes with Denisovans and that Denisovans and Neanderthals were also exchanging genes with each other. And I said, I'm comfortable with us calling these species and talking about them nonetheless exchanging genes. If we have evidence for that, and we actually have evidence for an F1 hybrid. So we have a specimen whose mom was a Neanderthal and whose father was a Denisovan. It's the specimen known as Denny about 90,000 years ago. If we had that kind of interbreeding that was possible between different species of hominins 90,000 years ago, couldn't that also be playing a role in this earlier time period? And I suspect it is. I, I mean, this time period around 1.8 million years ago, we have Homo erectus slasher gaster. We have Homo habilis and we have Homo rudolfensis. I suspect, based on some work I did in the first decade of the of the 21st century, um, I suspect they would have been interfertile with each other. And by interfertile, I mean they would have been able to interbreed with each other and produce offspring that were capable of reproducing themselves. So what I think is going on, and this leads to this tangled web metaphor that I borrowed from Michael Arnold, although he claims he's, he's like, I'm not sure. Cause I asked him, can I use uh, the tangled web metaphor in, in the book I'm writing? And he said, well, yes, I think that's a great idea. I'm not sure I, I came up with that <laughs> before I found it in, in a book. Um, but if we think about it, Africa starting at about, three million years ago and getting particularly tough around two and a half million years ago, you have some serious ecological environmental changes that occur with drying trends, with expansion of grasslands, retraction of forests. And I think probably this led to groups becoming geographically separated from each other. And by groups, I mean different species of, of Australopithecus or Paranthropus, as well as different species of Homo. And then when conditions become favorable, they're going to come back into contact with each other. So we're going to have differentiating species of the genus Homo. Some of that could be random genetic drift, just random genetic changes accumulating in small populations. Some of it could be related to selection, different selection pressures in different areas, but they're able to come back together. They're probably able to interbreed with each other. Now, it's really hard when we have genetic data, it's easy I shouldn't say it's easy because these people work really hard extracting this DNA <laughs> and then analyzing it. But with genetic data, you can say Neanderthals contributed genes to modern humans. Denisovans contributed genes to modern humans. That We have evidence of Denisovans and Neanderthals exchanging genes with each other as well. It's fascinating stuff. It's very unlikely that DNA is going to survive 2 million, 2.5 million years ago. We're just not going to uncover it. Now, they're there's some interesting work with proteomics 
looking at different proteins that can tell you something about who's more closely related to whom, or even the sex of the individual fossils. So that's a fascinating area of research. But I suspect these populations were exchanging genes with each other. And in part, I think that's part of the reason it's so hard to nail down the evolutionary relationships among them. So we don't know is Homo erectus more closely aligned with habilis? Is, is one of them ancestral to the other? Um, we have Homo erectus now at 2 million years ago. We have absolute great chronological data for Homo erectus at 2 million years ago. That specimen I mentioned at the beginning of our interview, um, the earliest member of the genus Homo 2.8, that hasn't been given a species status. It was published cautiously as Homo species indeterminate. The discoverer told me he thinks it's, it's Homo habilis. Um, so maybe Homo habilis goes back 2.8. But I think what we're looking at is rather than this sort of tree pattern where species are, are splitting apart and end up going their separate ways and not capable of reproducing with each other, I think we have more of a reticulated pattern um, where there's not just divergence, but convergence as well. And some people refer to it as a braided stream. In my new book, I'm, I talk about it as being a tangled web, which I think sounds kind of nice. But it's the same idea, right? That these relationships among these fossils are going to be complicated and it's going to make it really hard for us to come up with a simple explanation as to who's more closely related to whom. Well, it's been great catching up with you again, Trent, and I'm very grateful that you've been able to take the time out from your busy schedule to return to the show today. So what's new for you? Are there any um, upcoming projects you can tell us about? Sure. Well, it's great to feel like an academic again. I've stepped into administration, at least temporarily, and um, it's taken up a lot of our time. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's a challenge. Um, but I do have some projects that I'm supposed to be working on that are uh, uh, more or less on the back burner, but I hope to get to them soon. So I think I'm at that stage in my career where I'm doing a lot of review articles and retrospective type uh, work. And I was asked to submit an article about Neanderthal cold adaptation to the American Journal of Human Biology. I, I had an article, I was co-author on an article with Ted Stegman um, back in 2002, I think it came out, 2000, yeah, I think it was 2002. And now, you know, 22 years later, they're like, what do we know about Neanderthal cold adaptation? So I brought on board some great um, younger scientists who are working in this area. So we want to do sort of a, what we thought back 20 years ago about Neanderthal cold adaptation and what do we know now based on physiological work on, on people today and as well as um, the fossils. And as I've alluded to, I, I have another uh, book in progress. It's I, I tentatively titled it The Tangled Web, The Origin and Evolution of the Genus Homo. I submitted it to my same editor, the same press as the previous book, Columbia University Press. They've uh, the editorial board has approved it, sent it out for review. So hopefully the reviews are going to be okay. I've only written um, the preface, the introduction, and then the first five chapters. So I envision it having 10 chapters. So it's about this tangled web. I give a little background on the genus Australopithecus, the robust Australopithecus or Paranthropus. I talk about um, early Homo and the fact that they probably were interfertile with each other. I even have a little section in there where I, I talk about a specimen that might be an F1 hybrid in, in 1.8 million years ago. Um, so it, it's kind of a fun paper. I, I think I'll talk a little bit about in later chapters about the evolution of the genus Homo, Homo erectus in particular, and some of the features it has that, we sh that it shares with us today. They're very important adaptive features. So it's been a fun book to write. Um, when is it coming out? Uh, when I, if, if it's approved by the external reviewers, then I usually have a year to turn it around and, and get it out. And then it's probably at least another six months after that. So it, it'll be out in one and a half to two years is, is what I'm guessing. Thanks for asking about it. 
Trenton Holiday, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Mark. It's a pleasure. It was just as much fun as the last time, and I look forward to the next time as well. <laughs>